Episode four starts out with Pellegrini fast asleep as Hassan uses a drone to fly through his house to take pictures of compromising documents. But as he's doing so, he actually trips an alarm system and Pellegrini's security staff runs in to alert him that there's a threat. Now, they think it's a person, but it's not. It's just a drone. And when they find it, they're able to close it in and destroy it. They hand it over to Pellegrini, telling them that they destroyed anything that was on it. But Pellegrini notices that there's a note inside of the drone, and the note says, I'll get you. Now, the next day, as Dumont is sitting in a cafe enjoying his breakfast while reading the paper, he suddenly looks up, and there's Hassan. He asks Dumont, "Uh, let's talk about your friend, Pellegrini. What exactly did you want to tell him the other day? But Dumont learned his lesson. He doesn't say a word. And Hassan kind of figured this might happen, so he asks him, where's your wife? And Dumont says, at work. But he says, no, she's not there. And it puts the fear of God into Dumont. Hassan once again asks, what did you want to tell him? But instead of telling him what he wanted to tell him, Dumont asks him, if I give you a name, do you swear you'll stop? And Hassan agrees. And the name that Dumont gives him is Fabian Berriot. She was a journalist that was really going after Pellegrini until he kind of ruined her life. So with this information, Hassan gets up, walks out of the cafe, and Dumont calls his wife, but it turns out she was at work the whole time. Hassan was just bluffing. Hassan then went home to do some research on Fabian Berriot. And Barriott was a journalist who wrote a book on the Pellegrinis called Dirty Money, the Pellegrini Story. And it was all based in fact, but Pellegrini sued her, got her fired from her journalist job, which she was really good at. And now she just kind of lives her days as a borderline hoarder with her dog. So Asan reads the book to get a better idea of who she is. And then he heads to find her. And one day when she comes back from shopping, there he is sitting in her house. But she's not really all that flustered that he's there. I mean, she wants to know who he is, and he tells her, I'm a fan. I came to get your book signed. She ends up playing dumb with him, though, saying Fabian Barriott does not live there anymore, but he knows it's her. He then persists, but she continues to stick with the story that Fabian Barriott does not exist. Hassan tells her that the book that she wrote was the truth, and she says, well, yeah, no, it was the truth, until I faced an army of lawyers. Even after he tells her that they have a common enemy in Pellegrini, she still isn't interested in helping him. It's worth mentioning that the more that Pellegrini's name gets mentioned, the more her dog starts barking, to the point where Hassan can't ignore it anymore, and she admits that she taught her dog to bark every time he hears Pellegrini's name, which, you know, is a cool trick. Hassan tries to remind her who she was as a journalist, because she was a straight bulldog. But she's still pretty leery of Hassan. I mean, he did break into her house, and she asks him, how do I know you're not working for Pellegrini right now? And that's when Hassan comes clean with his real motives, telling her about his father. Hassan pleads with her, telling her, I need you. This book is powerful, and I need the woman who wrote it. But Barriott just shakes her head and says, no, I'm sorry. Pellegrini's just too well protected. Let it go. So Hassan leaves, but she had time to think about it. And the next day, she's able to locate where Hassan lives and meets up with him. And now it's Hassan wondering how she tracked him down, but she says a good journalist never reveals her sources. He gets in the car where she tells him that after having some time to think about it, she's agreed to help Hassan. They have a conversation about trust and how they both need to trust each other, and she asks for Hassan's name, but he gives her a fake one, and she knows it's fake. So she gives him one more chance, but he gives her another fake name, which she once again knows is fake, until finally, Hassan is forced to tell her that his name is Hassan Diop, and they then head off to Hassan's place, where she's really impressed with his setup. She asks him, though, for the full story about what happened with Hassan's dad, because he kind of just gave her the Cliff Notes version before, so he gives her the whole story. And he tells her that he's pretty positive that his dad was framed for insurance money. And she says that that would indeed check out. Back in 95, his company was on the verge of collapsing. And he would have used that insurance money to build back up his empire. They then get into how they're going to take Pellegrini down. And Hassan says they need something that he cannot bury. This isn't 1995 anymore. With the internet, it's a powerful tool. They need some damning, incriminating stuff. And luckily... Fabian thinks that she has just the item. The only issue is it's at her old job, which they know her face and she's not allowed in. So the two devise a plan where he's going to go in clutching an envelope looking very skittish with Fabian waiting in the car, but calling the front desk, posing as another journalist and telling the front desk employee to look out for this guy because he's an informant. And sure enough, the front desk employee falls for it and sends Asan right up where he's able to grab the videotape. But as he's heading down... The front desk employee is talking to another front desk guard, where he tells him that the journalist that Fabian was posing as is on vacation. So something's not right, and it forces Hassan to run out of the newspaper into Fabian's car, where they're able to narrowly get away. When they get back to Fabian's place, right before they pop in the videotape, she gives him a little backstory on what's on the videotape. It has to do with the terrorist attacks in Kuala Lumpur back in 96. 11 people were murdered in this attack, and 8 were French. And the middleman who sold the terrorists their weapons was Pellegrini. And on the video, that's exactly what you see. Pellegrini negotiating with these people for the weapons. 
And this video is damning. This is just what Hassan and Fabian were looking for, and Hassan tells her that he's going to put it up on Twitter, and it'll go viral by the next day. Now, while Hassan and Fabian were trying to think of a way to take Pellegrini down, the police were meeting with Dumont because they want to let him know that they think everything's connected. And against the wishes of his co-workers, Youssef tells him that he's pretty sure this guy is the inspiration from Arsene Lupin. But just like Youssef's co-workers, Dumont thinks it's absurd. They let Dumont know that they're going to go through a composite sketch to try to figure out what he looks like, and then they take off. But as soon as they leave, Dumont gets a text from Pellegrini asking him what he wants to talk about Babacar Diop, but Dumont says he needs more information. He'll be in touch soon. The police then go to do that composite sketch, and they get everybody that encountered Asan together. The issue is everybody's composite sketch looks different. The one police officer thinks it's just faulty equipment, but Youssef points out, yeah, it's crazy. It's just like the guy can change his appearance. But this is the information they have, and they bring it to Dumont, but Dumont yells at them, saying that none of these pictures look like the guy who kidnapped him. And that's when Youssef pulls out another one that he had done. Because he had gone to Vincent, Assange's accomplice from the Louvre, and Vincent was more than willing to give him a very detailed description on what Assange looked like. And the description that he gave him looks exactly like Assange. And even though Dumont knows it, he denies it to the police, saying that this isn't what he looked like. And it really frustrates Youssef, who yells, yeah, this is him. But Dumont changes the subject, criticizing the police and saying that he's planning on taking them off the case because it's been three weeks without the necklace and they don't have any information on it. But they promise that they can get the thing right, so he tells the two police officers that they're on the case and takes Youssef off of it. But once they leave the meeting with Dumont, Youssef tells them, guys, you just saw what happened. He knows something. And they agree that there's something fishy going on, but they can't investigate the police commissioner. The lieutenant tells them, man, just take a back seat. You're off the case. The next day, Assam was true to his word. The video has gone viral. And Juliet finds out about it while she's in a meeting, along with her father and a couple of other people, for this charity that she's going to start up. And when she sees the video, she asks to be left alone with her father. And she shows it to him, but he just casts it off as nothing because he doesn't understand the power of social media. Juliet is very concerned, though. She knows the power of social media, and as she's just about to start a charity, she knows that any negative publicity could really do damage to it. Pellegrini swears, though, that he's not hiding anything. He wants the video to go down because he's, quote, a little paranoid that people are coming after him. Something that, quote, didn't happen. And he actually does a very rare move for him by going out and addressing the media in front of his house. And while Hassan and Ben are actually watching this live, Pellegrini stands in front of the police saying that the whole thing is a lie. But Fabian, she's watching it in person because she has done something she hasn't done in years. She's joined her fellow press. And she is the one who actually asked him the question, do you think you have the victim's blood in your hands? And when Pellegrini notices who asked the question, he gets a little freaked out, doesn't answer it, and just goes back inside. And Fabian is really proud of herself. She's grinning ear to ear as she's walking back to her house. The problem is she notices she's being followed. So she quickly hurries her pace up and she's able to get home. And Hassan is actually there waiting for her to give her flowers because he's so proud of what she was able to do. And she has a rush of energy from it. She does mention, though, how she had one of Pellegrini's men following her. And Hassan gets a little concerned for her, but she says, don't worry. In my line of work, I know how to lose a tail. She then asks, all right, what do we do next? And Hassan's plan is to go on TV revealing who he is, or at least who he wants the public to think he is as this Twitter account that released the video. But Fabian doesn't want him to go on this particular show that he wants to go on because she says it is trash television, but Hassan says it might be, but it gets 2 million viewers a day. That's a lot of eyeballs on this thing. So she sees the logic with it, and she wants to go with him, but he says, no, I got you into this mess. I'm not allowing you to go with me. I'm going to do this myself. It's my turn to take the risk. So they both head back to Hassan's place as he prepares his disguise. And while applying some makeup, he gives Fabian a pen, hoping that it might inspire her to once again become a journalist. He then heads to the TV studio, where his disguise is that of a very old man. Best way I can describe it for basketball fans is Kyrie's character of Uncle Drew. The host of the show asks him, okay, can you describe what's in this video? And he tells the host that what you're going to see is Pellegrini selling the terrorists illegal firearms for the attack in Kuala Lumpur. But when they pop in the video, it's been completely doctored. It's made to look like Pellegrini actually pulled out of the deal when both Hassan and Fabian watched the real video. He clearly did not. And it totally takes Hassan off guard. It actually leaves Fabian cursing at the television. It's a really bad look for Hassan because there's nothing incriminating on this videotape. He's left speechless to the point where they actually have to go to commercial. And he turns to the host and says, all right, how much did he pay you? But it seems like the host legitimately has no idea what he's talking about, even though that's exactly what happened. Hubert Pellegrini is actually in the catwalk of the TV studio watching this all go down. And when Hassan leaves to get out of there, 
A couple of Pellegrini's goons try to stop him, but Hassan has worked on his fighting style since he was a kid, and he takes them both out without breaking a sweat. He's able to get out of the TV studio, rip his disguise off, and disappear. And when Pellegrini finds out that he was able to get away, he is pissed off. But he then gets a phone call from Juliet, who is watching it. And he tells Juliet, see, I told you, there was nothing to worry about. And that's when Juliet tells him, Dad, I think I know who's behind this. It's Hassan Diab. She tells her father how Hassan was the one who met her in the park, and she apologizes for not telling him sooner. And Pellegrini tells Juliet that Hassan has always wanted to destroy them because he's blamed them for his father's death. But Babacar Diop and those people in Kuala Lumpur aren't the only blood on Hubert Pellegrini's hands. Because Hassan, after leaving the TV studio, headed to Fabian's place where he sees her dog outside, which is really weird. And when he goes in, Fabian is hanging from the rafters in what's made out to look like a suicide attempt. When in reality, it was that goon from Pellegrini's that followed her. Because sadly, she didn't lose the tail. He saw where she lived. And he was able to muscle his way in where he demanded to know where Asan Diop lived, but she told him a good journalist never reveals her sources, and that's when he killed her. And when Asan finds her body, he's really broken up about it. He's able to compose himself, taking Fabian's dog with him back to his place because the dog now needs a new home, but also taking the book because she took that pen that he gave her and she wrote him a really, really nice note in it. But as Hassan is trying to plan his next move, at the police station, Youssef has the composite sketch from Vincent right next to a still from the television show that night, and he is convinced that they are the same guy, that he's got him. To understand Hassan, the main character in Lupin, is to understand his backstory. His father emigrated to France from Senegal and got a job as a chauffeur for a very rich, well-to-do French family. And while the woman of the house, Madame Anne, treated them pretty well, as well as the daughter of the house, Juliet, I mean, she was a teenager and she was kind of slutty, coming on to a very young Hassan, but he wasn't hating on it. Anyway, I'll get back on track. The man of the house, Hubert Pellegrini, was an asshole. And when one day this very expensive Marie Antoinette necklace went missing, of course, who are you going to blame? The Senegalese immigrant. Even though Assange's dad swore up and down that he had nothing to do with it. And the reason that Hubert really thinks he did it was because Hubert caught him in that very room the day prior. But Assange's dad wasn't stealing a necklace, he was dusting the bookshelf. And another person that was in the room that day was Madame Anne. And when Assange's dad says, ask your wife, Hubert says, keep my wife out of it and sends him off to jail. Madame Anne never says a word, and the necklace was never found. The first chance that Hassan gets to go visit his father in jail, he does so, but his father doesn't show up. And that's because his father had committed suicide. Or at least, that's the story that they're claiming. You get the idea that he might have been coerced into killing himself by other inmates. And when Hassan was burying his father, Madame Anne showed up, asking if she could do anything, but at that point, it's too late. And Hassan just walks by her and says, go fuck yourself. When Hassan went back to his house, he found a gift that his father had gotten him for his birthday. And it actually was a book from that bookshelf that Madame Anne told his dad that he could take home for him. The book is called Arsene Lupin, The Gentleman Thief. And Hassan read this book up and down, knowing every word, and really emulating Lupin. Lupin's whole thing is the fact that nobody knows who he is. And the fact that nobody knew who he was was his biggest advantage. But he was also one step ahead of everybody. He was a lone wolf, but he did have a certain sect of people that he truly trusted. Now, present day Hassan has just gotten a new job at the Louvre as a janitor. He goes to meet with his ex, who also happens to be the mother of his child, to tell her the good news about his new job, although she doesn't think it's going to last very long. It's worth mentioning, though, it does seem like the two have a really good relationship, though. He asks about seeing his son, and they set up a date for the weekend. He then heads to go visit some low-life gangsters who he borrowed money from. The issue is he doesn't have the money. And that does not sit well with the one guy, Vincent, who's the guy we borrowed the money from. He has his goon, named Kevin, dangle Asan over a balcony, but Asan says, wait, I have a plan to get us more money than we ever know what to do with. Asan has devised this plan centered around the Marie Antoinette necklace that is going to be going up for auction from the museum. And his plan is to steal it. He tells them that he can get them to the necklace because he works at the Louvre, he knows the museum inside and out, and no one pays attention to the maintenance men. So the plan is for Kevin, Vincent, and their driver Rudy to sneak in his janitors while taking out some of the security guards and switching out those uniforms. Asan is going to get them in with some swipe cards, and he tells them to put chloroform in some of the cleaning bottles so they can knock these people out. They then have to disarm the security footage, and when they do that, they have about seven minutes till the police show up. Asan, meanwhile, well, he'll be bidding on the necklace. And after he, quote, wins the auction, he knows that they send the necklace down to the foyer to be inspected and whatnot. That's where the group will grab the necklace, and at this point, 
Rudy is outside waiting in the getaway car, and they get out of there. And that plan is too good of a plan for Vincent to pass up. So, it comes the day of the auction, and Hassan shows up in a really good-looking suit, and the auctioneer starts explaining the history of the necklace, how when the necklace went missing, it wasn't sold as one piece, it was broken up. And Hubert Pellegrini spent his life trying to get back those diamonds and recreate the necklace until he was finally able to do so. And that is what is going up for auction. One person that is there to watch the auction go down is Juliet Pellegrini, and and Asan didn't really think that she was going to be there, but he's sitting far away from her, thinking that she probably won't notice him. The auction starts, people start bidding, and then Asan gets involved, although no one recognizes him. But Asan had planned on this, so he set up a fake Wikipedia page where he had 500 plus million euros listed as his net worth. So he checks out as far as they're concerned. During the bidding, though, he gets word from Rudy that the security camera footage is disabled, and now they have seven minutes. So he upbids everybody by an extra $20 million and wins the auction. Everything so far is going according to plan. But little does Hassan know that Kevin and Vincent are planning on double-crossing him. I mean, I'm sure Rudy was too, but Rudy had left to go in the getaway car. So Hassan, along with the auctioneer, head downstairs to the foyer to examine the necklace. The auctioneer is a little hesitant to do so because he hasn't gotten the money yet, but Hassan makes the claim that, hey, I just bid $60 million for this thing. I clearly check out. This thing's my new baby. Let me just take a look at it. And Hassan is able to get his hands on the necklace. But when he does, that's when Kevin and Vincent attack, taking out everybody in the room, including Hassan, and stealing the necklace for themselves. They flee the Louvre, get in the getaway car, but it's a little too much car for Rudy, and they end up crashing and going into the Louvre, getting caught in the process. When the police show up, the police captain wants to interview everybody, including Hassan, which the auctioneer thinks is ridiculous because he was attacked too. But Hassan plays it beautifully, saying, no, that's okay. The police are just trying to do their job. The captain, though, has never heard of Hassan and wants to know how he got his money. And he says, well, if you checked your cell phone today, you've made me money. The captain, though, does get a phone call that they caught the perpetrators and they've gotten the necklace back. They're sending it to the lab for testing to make sure it's legit. And he lets Hassan go. But as Hassan's walking away, the captain thinks better of it and decides to pat him down. Although all he finds is a pen from the Louvre. He then, for the second time, allows Hassan to leave, but Hassan doesn't leave. Going into a restricted area and changing into his maintenance man outfit. Because this whole plan was set up two weeks ago. Hassan knew that Kevin and Vincent were going to double cross him. And he had a friend of his make him a fake imitation necklace. So when Kevin attacked, Hassan dumped the real necklace in a trash can and threw the fake necklace on the ground, and they had no idea. And since no one pays attention to the maintenance men, that night as he's leaving this shift, he takes the trash bag, fools it full of dirty diapers, the cops really don't check it, and he's able to get the necklace out of there. Now this plan might have been for money, might have been for revenge for his dad. Either way though, the plan played out beautifully. The necklace, getting a job at the Louvre, this was right out of Lupin's playbook. The next day, he goes and picks up Raul, just like he planned with his ex, and he actually gives him the Lupin book, the same book that his father had grabbed from the Pellegrini library. But there's only one slight problem. Hassan is not the only one who's familiar with Lupin, because a police officer by the name of Youssef is very aware of Lupin. He, in fact, thinks that this story sounds way too familiar to Lupin. And when the police get word that the necklace that they have is fake, he starts to get very suspicious. And he is on to Hassan, or should I say, he is on to the fake name that Hassan used in the auction, Paul Cernin. 